You call bottom on ETH on October 23rd. What's your read on the market now for the next month? Interest rates just got hiked again. There was some big news about a guy named Elon Musk buying Twitter. It's not my proudest trade, but I did momentum trade Dogecoin. Decentralized science. Is it a right now play? Is it a six month play? Is it a one year play? What do you think? I do want to take advantage of such a rare opportunity and have more exposure, but how can I do that in a risk adjusted way? We are announcing our 13th portfolio company in the Metaverse Fund. Whether it's recession, spare markets, and so forth, every dollar you spent on growth is like spending maybe $10 in a bull market. We hit a new firm all time high. What's going on and welcome back to Inside the War Room. I'm here with my man, Dan Jablonski. It's our third episode and we're excited to dive into the markets today. And so right off the bat, Dan, what's been going on in the world of crypto? Anything interesting you've come across this week? Yeah, Felix, um, we're back, episode three. And I thought it was really pertinent to start today's episode with a quote from Matt Levine's A Crypto Story right up. And so this quote goes, if the world is increasingly software and advertising and online, social networking and good lord the metaverse then the crypto financial system doesn't have to build all the way back down to the real world to be valuable the world can come to crypto 100 so. percent. and it's it, it's funny because you know i think a lot of people from the traditional finance space they try to come to crypto and then the, all they talk about is let's say tokenizing real estate tokenizing gold right every single year someone else from the a couple of generations prior will co come and say like, hey, I've got this crazy idea. Why Bitcoin? Why don't we just tokenize gold? I'm like, well, who takes care of the custody? What about all the risks, you know, versus they you know where like, you know, that that needs to be stored somewhere. That storage needs to be paid for. That needs to be armed. Who pays the people protecting it and so forth. And so it's beautiful quote. I agree with the percent because we're going to this digital native world. And one of the examples of the world coming to crypto happened this week. Mm -hmm. Big news. Uh, JP Morgan, they executed their first transfer on chain. So uh, they forked Aave's ARC network and used the Polygon blockchain to execute a foreign exchange transfer of tokenized Singaporean dollar mm -hmm. and tokenized Japanese yen. Wow. What do you think about this? Well, <laughs> you know, first of all, I think the, the funniest thing about it is how Jamie Dimon has been a lifelong crypto hater. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I had to take all those comments back in 2017 and 2018 when, you know, let's say I would pitch the fund and some people saying, oh, but Jamie Dimon is saying Bitcoin is a scam it's, and so forth. In Jamie's defense, it was primarily Bitcoin related, but yes, continue. Right. I, I know we've got an ex JP Morgan over yeah, here. So. I, am, I am a JP Morgan alum, so I'm going to I'm going to take uh, not credit for this transfer, but I'm going to say <laughs> I'm very, very proud that they did this this week. <laughs> but but no, it's, but it's interesting, you know, JP Morgan, that, that's kind of the tone they started off with. And then over time, I forgot the name um, they did fork um, Ethereum at some point. It was something called Quorum, something along those lines. I was like in 2018. And then I know they also did Onyx. Mm -hmm. um, and now they've started doing some DeFi. Yeah. And so like, it's it's definitely fascinating to see like kind of the how far we've come, not just inside the space of crypto, but then also in terms of adoption and recognition. And, you know, the funniest part of it is, is that they actually, you know, they keep forking actual crypto stuff, right? They're not building it new in-house. They're saying, you know what? Aave actually works. This is great tech. Let's copy it. Ethereum is great. Let's copy it, right? Yeah. And so now it only stands to be seen, you know, whether this fork will gain traction or whether, you know, the original obby, so to say, will maintain Absolutely. relevance. Yeah, it certainly, I mean, it's it stands for a big piece of institutional DeFi now. And mm -hmm. this goes back to things that we've actually talked about on episode one and episode two with KYCing, mm -hmm. with institutions and the, you know, both like the large private sector, but also the public sector moving on to crypto and moving on to blockchain. Yeah. This goes hand in hand with that. I thought this was perfect to kick off episode three. A hundred percent. And I know this week was another big week, too, because it was another FOMC meeting. Um, you know, interest rates just got hiked again. Um, what's been your read on the meeting? Yeah, absolutely. So um, two things with the FOMC. I want to talk about one concern and then one catalyst. So mm -hmm. obviously we know another 75 basis point rate hike. Um, but during the press conference, which was the, the piece of the whole day that had the most gravity around it, uh, when Jerome was incorrectly led on to believe by a reporter, that the stock and bond markets were still rallying positively upon the rate hikes during his presser, where he was very hawkish. Mm -hmm. He was then asked by that same reporter what he felt about the positive market rally still. Mm -hmm. And reading into it, a lot of people believe that he was a little frustrated and he made comments directly that said there's just no forecast there's just no sense that inflation is coming down. This hinted too for the rate hikes down the line and maybe an implied stance from him that he feels any market rally could be very premature. So, so I had, 
I had a little bit of a different read on it. So I was like, you know, trading in real time. I was sitting at my desk. I've had him, I, you know, I have four screens essentially. I've had him on live. Yeah. I've had Twitter on where I was like scrolling through to keep an eye on sentiment. I've had the charts open. And it was kind of wacky because, you know, the initial reaction of the market was actually um, every news headline said it's, the pivot is coming. Yeah. Because in the initial release, they did say they were looking to potentially slow down yeah. on the hikes and so forth. Very dovish. And so I that. would say 90% of the presentation was rather we're approaching the, the final piece of this stretch you know rate hikes will continue but become will start being slowed and so forth and the only time when this tone really changed was that comment and you know i'm tr I'm trying to contextualize because like on one hand now people only take that let's say 20 second answer and say they know there's even memes on linkedin you know we're going from hawkish to more hawkish right yeah but i felt like he was dialing it down for nine percent of the time and then you know the man didn't have a chart in front of his face right yeah. so the, the the reporter said the market is rallying so in his mind probably you know stocks up you know well marks up five percent or so and so forth people are you know kind of getting a little bit over uh, ahead of themselves yeah. and so he wanted probably to put some caution be like hey don't get ahead of yourself mm -hmm. like there's more pain to come let's not go crazy because also like you know when people when people buy equities or any kind of asset, they're buying equity, they're selling dollars. So that doesn't necessarily help that whole situation either. Sure. And so now also in hindsight, because it's been two days, the DXY has started selling off again mm -hmm. and assets have found a bid. And so I think the, the, the real story, I think, is that even if the pivot is not here today, we all know that it's coming. Mm -hmm. And it is maybe a question of one or two more of those uh, FOMC meetings. Uh, you know, we are getting a CPI read next week. We also yep. have midterms next week. So yep. there's a lot of things happening. But, you know, I, I think that we're getting pretty close to the bottom. And yeah. that's also, a, you know, outside of um, the realm of just pure macro, you know, inside of crypto, there's a number. And you know, we met, we monitor, let's say, 20 different fundamental um, factors to identify where could be a top, where could be bottom. Mm -hmm. And virtually all of them are like giving bottom signals right now, yeah, right? Yeah. Let me let me stop you right there. On the point of CPI and also on the point of bottom signals, mm -hmm. CPI tops historically tend to coincide with equity market bottoms. Mm -hmm. And so rent CPI looks like it kind of topped out in September, slowly kind of coming back down yep. to earth. Year over year change in CPI so far has topped out in June, again, coming back down to earth. With the Fed being 100% focused on what could now be a, like a new peak inflation number yep. and using exactly what you said here some of these bottom signals i mean you you call bottom on eth on october 23rd mm -hmm. what's your read on the market now for the next for the next month i think we are in in the middle of a bull rally i'm not saying bull market but a bull rally so that that to me looks a lot let's say like in crypto 2019 where you had that stretch from april all the way to july well, Bitcoin went from 3,000 to 14,000, right? It's it's not a quick pump one month. No, this was April, May, June, July. It was a four-month stretch yeah. of significant returns. I mean, Bitcoin, again, 3,000 to 14,000, that's, you know, that's 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 a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it wasn't all-time highs. And at the same time, not every single asset appreciated. And so to me, something similar can happen where, you know, and then we'll see, you know, let's say, I'd say we have a couple months of good times ahead of ourselves, let's say two, three months. Yeah. At that point, we need to see, you know, A, how's the macro backdrop changing? Sure. Are, we, are things still problematic, Problematic, you know, is unemployment rising and so forth? Uh, you know, is there some of that re re reflexivity coming from higher rates, you know, that, you know, some contagion that we haven't seen yet? That's on one angle. Yeah. But on the other angle, are the new innovations that kind of bring life back into the crypto space? Yeah. And so, a lot of these signals are kind of popping off. And I'll share a couple with the audience here. Um, you know, there's, let's say there's 20 plus, some of them, you know, a lot of people, they don't like TA, so we're not gonna waste time on TA yeah. or like m moving averages, but there's a few actually fundamentally relevant yeah. ones that I kind of want to highlight. So one of those f f key fundamental things that I track are actually minor capitulations. Yeah. Why? Because, you know, in, in, with a minor capitulation, essentially miners come to a point when Bitcoin drops enough where it's no longer profitable for them to mine, right. which means they need to shut off machines. And yeah. then as a result, because they shut off machines, there's less people mining, yeah. which means all of a sudden it's taking longer to solve the, the blocks, which then leads to a decrease in difficulty. And right. you know, for the long stretch of history of Bitcoin, tradition, like over a long period of time, difficulty goes up, you know, because more and more people to start, start mining and so forth. But the rare times in bear markets when you have these crashes, miners go out of business and that means difficulty drops. And so we've had this at virtually every single major bottom. We had this at the bottom where, you know, where we measure one difficulty dropping significantly, 
but then over time, difficulty starting to go up again. And so we have this, and this is when, when difficulty starts going up again, this tends to be a, a buying signal that you know the, the, the worst is over. Why? Because this mining capitulation signals before miners go out of business, what will they do? They will sell their leftover Bitcoin supply. The moment they shut down, they've already sold everything. Yeah. So that kind of selling pressure is gone, right? And so you had this buy signal from mining capitulations in February of 2012, which was virtually the perfect bottom of the 2012 bear market, you know, because wow. it's been a while. Another time when this happened was in March of 2019, the perfect bottom when, ETH, when Bitcoin was at $3,000 in the last cycle. Mm -hmm. And then we had this happen again right after the COVID crash, right? And so then, you know, markets started rallying again. And then again, we had this one more time, and this is the entire history of Bitcoin now, um, in May of last year, when the market, you know, Bitcoin also crashed from 60,000 out to 20,000 once in Q1, Q2, yeah. and then rebounded. And so it's only happened five times in its history, and it just happened again. And yeah. so this just happened again. It has been a good bottom indicator before. Why? Because it does give you information about Bitcoin, um, you know, token flows when it comes to miners. Absolutely. So that's one. Another one is actually unrealized PL. And so the way this works is that because you can see when was a token last moved on the blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. And so then what they do is they say, okay, the last time it was moved, let's assume, that's the assumption, that this was your purchase price, this was your, your cost, yeah. right? And so then you can see, okay, well, if this if this token was moved a year ago at, let's say, $60,000, well, now you're underwater by 66%, right? Maybe somebody else bought it a couple more years ago at 10,000, so now you're up 100%. Yeah. And so the really interesting thing is there's a chart that essentially averages everything together to find out um, what is the average unrealized gain or unrealized loss on the average Bitcoin? And so what's really fascinating here is that this is, goes back all the way to 2010, 2011, right? Where every single time the unrealized gain, average unrealized gain was above 80, market topped out. Hmm. This happened, the last time this happened was when? February 19th of 2021, right? As Bitcoin reached 60, you know, 8,000, let's call it, right? Yeah. Now, on the flip side, when the average Bitcoin holder is down 20 to 25%, yeah. that's generally when the bottom kicks in. This was the, We had this three times. We had this in t February 2015, when the post Gox bear market was happening. Yeah. We had this again when, in February of 2019, when last bull market crash happened, yes. right? Perfect bottom. And again now, right now, you know, the average Bitcoin holder is down about 15 to 19%. And so mm -hmm. we're starting to see this bottom shaping and so that's another one. Yeah. And why is it? Because it's mass psychology, right? There's a certain point when everybody, when the average person is X amount profit, where they say, time to take some profits. Yeah. And then there's also a point where they say, I'm already down so much, now I'm holding, yeah. right? And the third and final is actually, you know, UTXO analysis, where we essentially tr uh, track, you know, the unspent transaction output of the blockchain. Right. Essentially, kind of similar seeing like, you know, when what are the holding patterns of these tokens? Like yeah. how long has a token not moved? Yeah. And so there's this another chart that's called like HODL waves. And essentially, you, you check how long has the average Bitcoin been held? And mm -hmm. so the interesting thing is right now, over 65% of all the Bitcoin existence have been held for more than a year. Interesting. And that is the highest number it's ever been at. Yeah. And so the reason that's relevant is because now, you know, the, it, there's never been a time in history where fewer short-term investors, fewer speculators are holding Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and more and more more long-term investors holding Bitcoin than ever before, which also means there's a lot more uh, steadfastness where they're not gonna sell, they're likely holding. And right. so everything from seeing, hey, miners have likely already sold, they can't sell anymore. Right. The average person is already at 20% loss, and they've held so far, which is supported by the third party, which is that the average person, so 65% so of all Bitcoin have been held for more than a year. Right. Um, the floor is likely in because they, all the remaining speculators, all the remaining like operators, like miners, have been washed out. Yeah. Um, and so like that, those are just three of like you know twenty I monitor. But it's just interesting because a lot of these signals they don't happen every week, every month. They literally happen once a cycle. And so the fact yeah. that you know we've had this crossover where the same signals that happen at two or three cycle bottoms, there is some relevance there. Yeah. You know, do you bet the house on it? No, but it does definitely you know educate your decisions. Interesting. So with these bottom signals on Bitcoin, with calling the bottom on Ethereum two weeks ago, how are you expressing the long bias view right now? Are you using options? Are you buying calls? Are you closing shorts? Are you increasing exposure via leverage? And this goes back to an, an investor call that we actually had this week. And so like, how do you use exposure and how do you use leverage in this time? Right, yeah, because I mean, it's, you know, it's easy to say, we have this perfect bottom. So, you know, as I said, you know, it's, it's easy to say, why don't I bet the house on it, right? Sure. If it's been right four out of five yeah. times. 
And of course, since it is such a rare opportunity, I do want to take advantage of such a rare opportunity and have more exposure, but how can I do that in a risk adjusted way? And so there's really, I would say three angles to it, which is the first angle, like we've discussed at length in the prior war rooms, we are doing long short still, mm -hmm. you know, that is something I would certainly phase out as we get closer to bull market. We're mm -hmm. not there yet because mm -hmm. in a bull market, even the silliest tokens yeah, can, shouldn't be can, can go up. Right? right. So I will be completely out of all shorts. Um, you know, where does a bull market start? Um, let's call it at, at least Ethereum north of 3000. You know, yeah. we don't even need a new all time high because there will be some anticipatory rally as we get close to all time high. But as long as we're under 3000, that's still a bear market to me. Yeah. Um, so that's one angle. The second angle, and, and you know, to, to highlight, you know, exposure, you know, you can look at long short in one of two ways. Either you say, like, look, I am, you look at the short angle and say, like, I'm betting that, let's say, Axie will decline in price. But equally, even if Axie stays flat, that short enables me to go longer ETH, right? Yeah. Because like for that, I need to pair that $1 short with a dollar long. Yeah. It's now also have more ETH exposure or yeah. whatever it is that I'm bullish on. You know, other things we were bullish on is like Cosmos and Matic and they've yeah. had a phenomenal week. Um, the other two angles are then, you know, options and like direction leverage. When it comes to options, you know, something we did at the bottom, you know, because when we were at the bottom, there was, of course, a lot of uncertainty um, but we, you know, my, my perspective was that we have maybe 20% left to go down and a lot of room to go up. Yeah. And so the way I expressed that idea is that what I did is we did a synthetic long essentially, but with, you know, out of the money strike prices. So the way that looked is like, you know, we sold puts, let's say ETH was at 1,200. Yeah. We sold puts at $800, $900, $1,000, right? Yeah. Meaning we were, if ETH were to drop below those prices, we'd be forced to buy at these prices, even if it was lower, right? Sure. Sure. Now, how do you hedge against that? You have a cash position, right? So for example, I knew that, look, if I have per every thousand ETH at a thousand dollars strike price, I need to have a million dollars sitting in cash to, you know, cover that. Right. Which then, you know, allowed me to have a little bit of cash exposure so that I'm not all in. So like mm -hmm. if, if ETH were to drop to a thousand one hundred, nothing's lost because I'm in cash and the put is still worthless at that yeah. point, right? But on the flip side, selling these puts enabled us to also buy call options, yeah. a little bit out of money, but like 1,700 strike price, 1,800 strike price, which now like are $50 from being in the money. Right. And you know, since they're somewhat longer dated, you know, like they were like quarterly options, so like they're expiring at the end of December, yeah. now we've got a lot of long exposure. And the great thing is too, we were able to close out, you know, those puts for pennies. And so now that entire risk is gone. Since the puts are closed out, we were able to go long with the cash. Yeah. And so now we're long cash and we have this extra synthetic long that was paid for for free yes. by the puts. 100%. And so so that was that was one interesting way. Um and then of course the last one is you know when it comes to directional leverage, but that's where I'm very different from most managers where you know, in, in traditional space and in, in equities, although like this year was proof that you shouldn't do it, right? There's there's always cross collateral and isolated collateral where right. you say essentially, are you collateralizing a perpetual future? Are you collateralizing a margin uh, loan and so yeah. forth with your entire book or with just a fragment of it, right? Yeah. And so, you know, in equity space when draw, where drawdowns are maybe like a little more limited, it's very common to do cross collateral. Plus a lot of the counterparties actually have contractual rights that if you lose more than you lose, you, they can still come after you. In crypto is very different where in crypto, um, you can, you know, there's any kind of futures exchange like a FTX, a Binance, and so forth. You have isolated margin where you can say like, hey, all that can be lost is in this account, and they right. have liquidation systems. Like right. FTX is a very well-known liquidation system because it's kind of annoying, but if you you, you got you got to know how it works, and then you can structure your trades. Yeah. But so what's interesting here is that that then enables you to say, look, how much am I willing to risk on this idea, right? Yeah. So if you say, for example, uh, I believe that now this breakout happens, and you might say, look, I'm willing to risk one percent of my balance, I'm really willing to risk one percent of AUM. You can then put that into an isolated margin account, and you know, of course, you know, take a directional bet on it. Where you say, look, I don't believe Ethereum is going to drop more than twenty yeah. percent. In that case, you could take five x leverage on only that small isolated account. The irony with leverage is that you know, right now when we're close to bottom, probably most people won't take it. Even yeah. though you can literally measure out with Bitcoin, for example, you could put your stop right below the lowest point it's gone. And that's n it's not that far below, you know, we're like yeah. 21,000, it bottomed at like 18,000. So yeah. you could have a fairly fixed amount of risk, something to the tune of 10%, yeah. right? But what, what, what will people do? They generally only start entering these kind of trades when when the market is already rallying. Interesting. And then the two things happen. One, you, you're potential risk expands dramatically because right. now like it could re the lows, right? right? But now you you might be 30% from lows, 40% from lows. Yeah. And equally, there's a lot more volatility that can like, you know, get you stopped out, can get you liqu liquidated and so forth. So one of the things that you had mentioned there was about Polygon and Atom, mm -hmm. both having good weeks. 
Um, I know there were, and we even talked about earlier with the, the with JP Morgan using Polygon, but what are some of the things that you're kind of following on Polygon at the moment? Yeah, so I mean, Polygon has been fascinating as a, as a business development case, you know, because I think crypto gets a lot of heat for not making it into the mainstream, mm -hmm. where everything's just this little reflexive circle of crypto, native crypto users, but nobody in the real world uses it. And right. so Polygon has right. really sh shined, shown um, in attracting these massive names yeah. from Robinhood, I believe, is building a trading interface yeah. on Matic. By the way, Matic and Polygon are the same thing, just they, they reprint at some point for those that don't know those names. So, and then, so Robinhood moved on there. Um, you said JP Morgan, you know, did that trade on there. You've had recently Instagram announced that you can now buy and sell NFTs yeah. on Polygon, but it directly on the Instagram uh, app. Um, Reddit, you know, yeah. recently launched their own um, NFT wallets and NFT uh, marketplace, I think. Uh, you can comment more on that. And that was also on Polygon. So, like, there's like yeah. four, five, six huge names this year alone yeah. that Polygon onboarded. Yeah, Reddit is doing, Reddit has more active wallets uh, for NFTs on Reddit than, than OpenSea has on OpenSea. Mm -hmm. uh, over 3 million now. Um, another comment that I was going to make about that is uh, also, we, you used to be really long on decentralized web, and one of the pieces of that is AR Weave. Mm -hmm. And AR Weave is, is they had a 60% rally this week when uh, news broke that they are storing data for these Instagram NFTs. What do you think about, you know, as we're starting to see bottom signals, are you thinking about maybe a little rotation back into, into some of these like longer tail projects again? So my concern is that, you know, and we discussed this maybe like one or two uh, war rooms ago where I said, you know, every single rally gets faded. And so for mm -hmm. example, even with AR wave, you know, at some point because of that news, it, it spiked all the way up to $18 mm -hmm. and it's back down to about 14, right? Now yeah. it, it did maintain some, I mean, it started at 10. So that's still a massive move. But um, the, the concern remains that most of these protocols, whether it's an AR wave, you know, a handshake, a helium, yeah. they don't really make money yet, Not right? Yet. And so, I think to me, those are bull market plays. And as I said, I don't think we're in a bull market till 3000 at least. And Interesting. so till then I'm holding off because I've seen this with many other tokens where they have a great announcement, it yeah. goes up and then over the following month, it gives everything back. Yeah, so let's talk about some stuff that you did in, in short term plays then. Mm -hmm. um, any sp special situations of note the last the last week or two? I know uh, there was some big news about a guy named Elon Musk buying Twitter. Yeah, so you know, it's, it, it's funny. Usually I'm the guy when like people call and they say, you know, like, I, was, I, yeah, I meet people and they're like, oh, you know, what do you think about Doge? I'm like, are you serious? Yeah. Fuck, you know, screw friggin' Doge. You know, it's a meme coin. It's a yeah. shit coin, right? But, but by definition, it is, right? Like, I, I have no, it has culture, sure. But yeah. here's the interesting thing. Like, you know, there's a there's a saying, you know, do you want to be right or do you want to make money? Yeah. And there is, <laughs> if something I've learned is that two things. One, at the when a bull market begins, unfortunately, a lot of times meme coins leave. Yeah. It's silly, but you know, th th that's where retail goes, yeah. right? So that's number one. And then number two, e Elon and Doge go hand in hand, right? Um, and so the, the what, I, what I saw happening was two things. One, there was a breakout slowly starting to happen on Doge. And that happened at the same time when, you know, I was bullish, Ethan said, you know, the bottom may be in. So I'm like, okay, I think the bottom may be in. All of a sudden I start seeing meme coins go up. And then number two, Elon was about to acquire Twitter. Yeah. And so then I was like, well, if there was ever a chance for like a strong narrative rally on Dogecoin, yeah. it probably is now. And so it's not my proudest trade, but I did momentum trade <laughs> Dogecoin and we did close in a profit. Um, but that was a, it was really interesting because it is super reflexive to what's happened with Elon. Because the interesting yeah. thing is, as there was speculation of him acquiring Twitter, yeah. Dogecoin went up. The moment Twitter announced that they will no longer be doing a crypto wallet, yeah. Dogecoin crashed, yeah. right? And so, you know, that's another way, you know, like special situations like, just trading around news events, trading around sentiment and understanding yeah. the market because ultimately fundamentals matter, but then it's also what the market deems valuable mm -hmm. that matters, right? If the market yeah. deems Dogecoin valuable because of some Doge, like, you know, Twitter integration, yeah. who am I to disagree with the market? Absolutely. And uh, another new segue topic overview theme that has kind of not for the first time emerged on our radar, but one that we want to talk about today is decentralized science. Yeah, so decentralized science, DeSci. Tell me about your thoughts on, on DeSci. What do you think is going on there? Is this an, is this another thing too? Is it a right now play? Is it a six month play? Is it a one year play? What do you think? Yeah, so it's funny, you know, I have new topics come across my radar a lot, yeah. you know, and usually what I say is like, look, the first time I hear something, I usually, I hear it, probably ignore it. Second time I hear it, I'm like, okay, you take, take note of this and like put it on your 
to-do list. And then if you hear it three times, you're like, okay, maybe I should dig into this, right? And yeah. so I've had a number of instances where I came across these. I, the first time I think I saw it was actually when Martin Shkreli, straight out of jail, um, started his own DSI project, <laughs> right? Uh, and I mean, he's like the famous pharma bro. And yeah. so I was like, DSI, huh? That's an interesting name, new, right? Yeah. And then um, I, I, I had a call with Adam Draper uh, from Boost VC, and they're starting to look into DSI. And he mm. actually had like a four part um, uh, podcast series on DSI. Yeah. And then I started seeing on Twitter here and there. And I was like, okay, now you got to take this time and like st- yeah. to peel back the onion. And so the TLDR is, first of all, you know, it's not something we're allocating to yet. I think that's something that could be super interesting in the next bull market and that, yeah. that does feed into this potential new, this new um, whole list of narratives. You know, we have yeah. new narratives from like DSI to tokenized music and so forth that could really bring fresh life back into crypto where Absolutely. it's no longer just DEXs, but now we're like, hey, we are literally tokenizing research. We're yeah. tokenizing music rights and so forth. But to bring it back. Creator economy. Yeah. Um, creator economy. So here's a funny thing. One of the headlines of one of the podcasts I listened to actually said that, um, you know, scientists are one of the most underappreciated participants of the creator economy. Yeah. Because ultimately, they, you know, they oh, do yeah. research and they create new innovations. Absolutely. New, you know, new solutions and so forth. Yeah. And there's, there's a really messed up incentive. Like everything that crypto tries to solve is like moving middlemen improving incentive structures and so forth. Yeah. And so the science community has a really weird, um, you know, incentive structure where first of all, like in order to become a scientist, you've got to go through tons and tons of school, right? So you're yeah. probably spending hundreds of thousand dollars to get that PhD, yeah. right? And then, you know, you are a research assistant at a university and a lot of times, you know, poorly paid uh, and so forth and the university might t- take rights to it. And then if you p- publish a paper, right? It, your, your paper alone is not going to get recognized. You have to get into a journal, right? A scientific journal. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times these scientific journals, they actually then charge you money yeah. to publish your thesis there, hmm. right? And so the number they quote on one of the podcasts, I think they said it's like $11,500 to publish something in those scientific journals, right? Yeah. And so this is kind of weird because, you know, you spent, let's say, two years doing crazy research, coming about something new, putting it together, and now to pay to publish it? You should be paid for that work you did, that research you did, 100%. right? But it's the other way around. And so then there's this mix of, on one hand, uh, gatekeeping with money, but then it's also kind of like a who do you know culture, right? Like, can you even get published if unless you have like a warm introduction and yeah. so forth? And so, yeah. uh, and then also like everything is like based on peer review. And so if whoever has been anointed to, you know, be a valid peer reviewer, right, yeah. says, hey, I disagree with this, maybe because I got lobbying money, yeah. then it is no longer accepted in the scientific community, right? Yeah. And so like, and that was, that was simplified. And of course, you know, I'm not, I'm not claiming to be a scientist, but like, it's, it's been an interesting journey, just like kind of like delving into the space and seeing, wow, yeah. you know, this is another way where crypto and blockchain can apply, yep, exactly. where you can crowdsource knowledge, you can crowdfund resources to then yep. support that research, you can maintain more IP in the hands of the actual scientists, yeah. you can fund causes like research causes, yeah. right? That might be unpopular, whether it's to governments, to institutions, and so forth. Yeah. Because you know, in, in in today's world, if you're doing if you're doing research, that's kind of culture, and that's literally research for research is there to find truth. Yeah. Right. And so, if from the get go we say, I don't like that kind of truth, so we're not going to fund it. Right. Yeah. How silly is that? Like research should be funded, you know, for for the merits of the research, right? And so that's something huge that that can happen there. And it's important to give credit, just like in metaverse was called VR before crypto got involved, right? Yeah. That exists before. Yeah. So DSI, there's been a long term, there's been a movement for a long time called open science, right? Okay. And so open science has been around for a while, but now they found that, hey, you know, there is a way to utilize blockchain for this and take it to whole new levels. And mm-hmm. so anyway, that's the, the tangents coming to an end. Um, that is essentially, I think, one of those topics that could be exciting for those next three, four, five years. It's something we're watching. and. It's probably there, there likely will be tokens on the market in that next cycle. And yeah. so that's something, you know, I'm beginning to at least lay the groundwork so that if there is a thematic rallying D side, yeah. um, the hedge fund on the liquid side can take advantage of that. That's awesome. That's awesome. And now shifting gears entirely, totally. Let's focus on the Metaverse Fund. Um, big last two weeks, we are announcing our 13th portfolio company in the Metaverse Fund. Um, it's called Live, L I B. What is Live and why did you invest in it? Yeah, so we've already backed, you know, a number of companies in, in the XR space from like, you know, XR concerts with Red Pill. You know, there's another company we looked at that, you know, we might advance in potentially, you know, Victor XR, they do VR education. And so, yeah. you know, the thesis is basically there already that people will spend a lot of time in VR, Absolutely. right? Now, what do people do in the real world when they're going out to events or live happens? They capture content, right? Yeah. You know, they might take a selfie, they may take a video and so forth. 
And that is some the piece of the puzzle that has been kind of missing for VR. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when you're live streaming, like you're a streamer showing VR, it's, it's really overwhelming to watch because, you know, the person making all these motions that the person watching that isn't do, yeah. doing, right? Like when you play a game, very steady. VR, a lot of things happening. So it's not perfect for content creation. Right. And so what Live does is, is it, it creates co creator tools for VR, AR, XR. Mm. And beyond that, one of the most incredible things I saw was the actual volumetric capture. And so what mm. that means is that if I'm experiencing something in VR, let's say it goes to a concert of Red Pill, yeah. right? Not only can I like take a quick snap screenshot, snapshot of like what I'm seeing, yeah. but I can actually record that entire experience as a volumetric memory. And so what that means is that wow. you can, this memory now exists as a, not as a video, but as a 3D experience where I can then after the fact, step into that memory what? and walk around from all the different angles. What? So, you know, this maybe- some Black Mirror stuff right well, here. Well, here's the crazy thing. Like, let's say like, let's say this was in VR, right? And like, you've only experienced the war room from your eyes looking at me or there yeah, and so forth, right? Course. But if this was, you know, a volumetric capture inside of Live, right? You could then step into your memory, stand right there, and look at yourself wow. hosting this interview and so wow. forth. Wow! And so, super incredible tech. It is the market leader in that kind of segment right now. It's being used yeah. by all the you know content creators and VR streams and a lot of VR companies. Yeah. Um, incredible cap table, you know, with everybody from you know Amazon, Samsung, Bitcraft. Um, yeah. This goes on. But and you know what I really liked, I, I did a couple of talks to AJ, the founder. Um, there's there's a lot of opportunities of what can be done with that. You know, I think not the least of which is, and you know, that's not officially their plans. Um, you know, and it's not it's not their plans unofficially either. But like you know, one idea I had is that you know, to me, that could be a first segue into a VR social network mm. because ultimately, if I spent all my if I, if we spent so much time in the metaverse in yeah. the virtual reality, right, it would make sense for you to why not capture virtually everything? Yeah. And because you never know when the big moments in life happen, right? There's so, there's so many times when you wish like, man, I wish I had like filmed that, yeah. right? Yeah. And so now I can capture every moment from let's say the kids in school in uh, Victor XR yeah. to maybe going to concert in Red Pill, maybe playing around in, in Vail, right? Yeah. And like having that, capturing that crazy kill shot that you did or capturing that when your favorite song, when your roof was played in a bloom, you know, or, yeah. <laughs> you know, when the, you know, some, the, the teacher said something funny, right? Yeah. And you can then clip that and create like a memory hall yeah. where you can, you know, actually place these memories. And they're now no, they're not just like re-experienceable, relivable to you, yeah. but you can also show others. Like imagine wow. like I could take you to my memory hall, like instead of me like telling war stories from like the last few, five years around the fun, I'm like, yeah. check, come, come check it out. And I show you like, oh, this is when that happened. This is when that happened. And wow. we can, it's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember, it's a little bit like in Inception, you know, where yeah. they're in the elevator, uh -huh. right? And they're like loading them, that they can see the memories yeah, visually. Absolutely. absolutely. And that's what it enables and super excited to be part of the team, and actually, you know, AJ, he said he, uh, in his research on me, he, he watched the last war room. He said that oh, he nice. liked the war room. So shout out AJ. Nice. Um, and you said like you said, Liv's been on your radar from the beginning. So um, in one of our conversations, another prospect call this week, um, we were asked, "How do we source deals? How do you source deals? What?" And 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 this comes from a lot of different ways. I I, I know that, but what works? What yeah. actually works when it comes to sourcing deals? That, 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 that's, that's a good qualifier too, because you know, we've really like six sources of deal flow, sure. uh, which to r rattle them off real quick, you know, we've gotten introductions from LPs, we've mm -hmm. got venture partners that introduce us, yep. we've gotten introductions from prior founders. Mm -hmm. um, and we do top-down research where I just say like thematically, let's look into BCIs, right? Boom, and then we found Neurable. Inbound. Um, then uh, inbound, right? Which is a lot. We, we get maybe five pitches a day yeah. because we're very niche fund. We're metaverse focused fund. So everybody raising for metaverse tends to reach out to us. Right. Now that being said, um, I found that warm introductions by qualified people have beared the most amount of fruit, right? Yeah. Where for example, Absolutely. like, you know, Liv came through a recommendation from uh, Jonathan from yeah. XLab, right? Yeah. Um, and so like that was a founder recommending, you know, Red Pill came at a recommendation from Subpack, from Todd, yeah. right? Um, you know, the Bornless Cathedral Studios came at a recommendation from um, Jamie from Vulcan Forged. Yeah. Um, and so there's, and then, you know, Cookie 3 was an introduction from one of my LPs. And so like a lot of the, the book has been really in warm introductions from yeah. people we have good relationships with. Yeah. The sixth one, I forgot to mention, is also like other VCs. You know, we've been building a really long list of like yeah. uh, co-investors, like other VC f funds that we've good relationships with that yeah. want is, us in on rounds. Yes. And so that's starting up more and more now too. Um, but I would say, you know, 
50, 60 percent through like these really warm structures from qualified people. Because I mean, talent sees talent, right? If a really good founder yeah. says like, "This is a person like I would invest in them if yeah. I had the money," then like I will let me talk to him, let oh, me find out. Yeah. Um, and then the other part I would say still is top down research, where you know whether that's uh, I believe a shapes and uh, a neurable, those were all top down. Where I said like, "Hey, let's f let's identify these sectors yeah. and find who the best player in them is." Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so. An, 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 another question in this realm, um, this actually comes as, as an LP question. Um, what struggles have you faced as a first time VC fund manager? And like, how have you overcome these? We'll just, we'll just stick broadly here. I think the most important part when it comes to running a VC is that maximizing the amount of homework you do ahead of time will save you a lot of work afterwards. Um, I like that. And it's, it's so true, and this is why our due diligence process has been growing and growing and yeah. growing. You know, yeah. it went from, you know, I'll say like, you know, our, our, our first month was a little bit more off the cuff, but by now we have like an eight step due diligence process where we do everything from, you know, we're reviewing the decks, we're getting on a call, we're doing, we've got an 80 question due diligence questionnaire. Um, then I get involved, you know, we do reference checks. We call at least three of the prior VCs, three prior customers, you know, we um, do an onsite visit while we'll fly out and meet the person at IRL, shake their hand, get yeah. to know them a little bit, right? Yep. Like yep. all these things, and we, you know, I wish at some point I need to make a graph that kind of highlights how much drop off is at each stage, yeah. right? And of course, the biggest drop off happens in the very beginning from the decks of to course. the calls and so forth, but it's still relevant that like, there are companies that have failed our DD process at the reference check. There yeah. are companies that the failed our step. process at literally the final step, the onsite visit. Oh yeah. And so those, those matter a lot, right? And that there's a reason why, you know, doing your home makes a difference and like in, in, but I think it's easiest felt when you say like hey I'm willing to spend these hours and hours and hours and hours like you know cross my T's and dot my I's because it will say, save me 10 times that time down the road yeah um, and so I think that's that's one of the most important aspects yeah um, and then also I think a second part because we came out of a raging bull market both in, in the in the private markets and public markets yeah where there was way more rush yeah. right like I still I had maybe two more months of this environment yeah. where I would talk to founders and they'd be like, we're closing the round on Friday. Yeah. And they weren't even joking, right? Like that was actually the, the reality of the market at the time. Where, Cause this happened yeah. to me in 2021. There was a company I went to back. I had a call on Tuesday and he said, the closing end of the week. I let him know on Thursday and said, actually we're already scrubbed. Can't take your money. I'm like, what? Wow. Wow. It's been less than 48 hours, yeah. right? And so like I came from knowing that environment. So again, that motivated a little bit faster decision making at the beginning, but now, we realized, you know, with this market slowing down a little bit, you know, yeah. capital drying up a little bit, we're taking our sweet time, you know, not in a way where we're no, it's annoying to the founder. Like we, like we're not waiting for the sake of waiting. We're wait, like we're doing our research and taking our time, yep. and that hasn't been an issue. And and beyond that, I think it's also important as a VC to be to know what, where on the power equation are you, right? Right who needs who more. And so understanding that like in this market environment, capital does go a long way. Absolutely. Um, asking for better terms, you know, being comfortable saying like, hey, let's work in a liquidation preference or saying, yeah. hey, let's, uh, you know, let's get in a token warrant from day one. Yeah. Or, um, the, I mean, you know, maybe increasing the interest rates on the, the convertible note or, you know, uh, if you invest before the lead, you know, getting a discount, doing it VR safe. I mean, there's, there's so many small things you can do, yeah. but that still will, I think at the end, you know, increase your MOIC by like a significant amount. Yeah. Um, those small things I think is a difference also between like, you know, the, the average VC that just like signs whatever's given to them and actually digging and saying, okay, how, what can I do here yeah. to increase my return? Same thing, maybe looking to secondaries, those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. It's a bear market. Mm -hmm. Transitioning to the final piece of our episode, exciting news overnight. We hit a new firm all time high. That is right. I say that because even though it's exciting right now, it's still a bear market. Mm -hmm. And we both see like how much more growth potential there is. And so as much as it's a celebration, it's like a celebration with the warn on top of it of like, we really need to hit like these next six months for even more growth. So tell me about that. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not even excited. Well, of course, yes, I, yeah. I'm excited that we know we hit an all time high in a bear exactly. market. But that being said, what I'm really excited for is for what's to come. Right. Like that's really the thing that really gets me giddy now from the, like, and it's still like, of course, very level had feet to the floor, but like it gets me excited from the angle that 
the things that will be possible with that, yeah. right? Like as we, you know, if we're already at a new all time high, and again, not performance wise, we're still down for the, I wanna be transparent there, cause right. like everybody else, the market is bad, but we're you know, doing well there too. But from an, in terms of assets, yes. all time high, that enables more resources. Like a lot of competitors have to do layoffs. A lot of competitors have to literally kill off entire str like parts of the business that aren't working. With us, um, that means we can launch new products. Yeah. That means we can do more hires. That means we can, you know, expand while everybody's contracting. Absolutely. And so, really excited, to, like you know, use that positioning yep. to hit the gas pedal and mm -hmm. say, like, hey, you know, uh, if before I had a five-year vision for yeah. what we want to build here, maybe we can do that in three, right? And so, and because I, I very much believe, and I've talked about this at length before, is that like whether it's recession, spare markets, and so forth, you know. Every dollar you spent on growth is like spending maybe ten dollars in a bull market. Absolutely. Every hour you spend on building is, you know, like many hours in, in the bull market. Every yeah. dollar I raise, right? Every dollar we raise goes like five dollars in yeah. a bull market. Because by the time the bull market comes back, you know, I, I talk about bull market starts at E three thousand. Well, at E three thousand, a like assets should should double at beta one, yeah. right? So there's a lot of growth already baked in to anybody that is, you know, joining the, the, the crypto space um, at, at these levels. And so it's just, I'm, I'm happy with where we are. It, it took a lot of work. Um, it was a grueling year for yeah, sure. You know, it was a tense to manage, um, but I'm glad, you know, we a clawed our way back on the performance front, but then also on the asset front, you know, with very loyal investor base and then also finding a lot of traction and, um, you know, finding people that want to bet on us, you yeah. know, that, that that maybe have been following us for a couple of years and said like, hey, now's the time. Um, and you finally making that shift from, you know, this uh, emerging shop that manages just no, normal accredited investor money to in more institutionalized funds that Absolutely. now can, you know, represent some really incredible people out there. A hundred percent. And and with that positioning too, um, I was on a call this week with a service provider and uh, they were so kind as to compliment us on branding mm -hmm. and especially branding over the last six months through output, through content, through social media, through impressions, and most importantly, like through word of mouth. Yeah. And I think that really like, that really hit home to see like what, what we've done over the course of this bear market. And I think like it goes without saying, but that's a really good time to work in like how appreciative and how grateful like we are for the opportunity to like get to do this, yeah. to have fun with it and to keep growing. Yeah, so, and that applies to everybody. You know, like to me, like this is a whole ecosystem because on one hand, we have our LPs who, you know, they they move mountains. Like, I mean, they, they make up the whole business, right? Yeah. But then beyond that, I also see that the people watching the content, people watching the war rooms, you know? Yeah. I've got some followers, you know, they might be 25 years old. They will not invest for another decade. Yeah. But the good thing is we're a young team. We'll be here a decade from now. And <laughs> so, you know, well. there's a lot of people that, you know, might learn from us today or in, in whether or not they just learn or whether, you know, they start like becoming part of the family and they, you know, um, you know, share information with us. Maybe they say like, hey, here's a company you should talk to that might be yeah. investable. Yeah. Um, or, you know, here's, you know, someone else I could learn from. Like all these kind of things, they matter. And so I think what we're really doing at the bottom line here is like building an ecosystem and building a community 100%. and you know i think that's something that i think also makes us unique as a financial company because yeah. most financial companies it's it's very dry it's very closed doors and i you know especially um you know there are there are compliant ways for you to actually be able to like hey let's let's unveil a little bit like what are we doing behind the scenes what do some of the trades look like what are some of the opportunities we're seeing absolutely and and that's what we aim to do here with inside the war room that's right and this was episode three with that anything else to take us home no i think with that we'll see you next time have a good one